This media has been made available by Mosaic Boston Church. If you'd like to check out more resources, learn about Mosaic Boston and our neighborhood churches, or donate to this ministry, please visit mosaicboston.com. My name is Ivy. I'm the lead pastor here at Mosaic Boston, Jamaica Plain, and if you had joined us today, we are thrilled that you are here. If you're joining us online, we are uh, thrilled that you have joined us online, and we hope that you get a lot out of today. If you want to respond in any way to the message, um, the way that you're going to do that is through a digital connect card, or as I affectionately call it, and everybody gets embarrassed when I do, a digi card. It is, um, a, you can, you're going to dial, or uh, text to the number 33777, you text MOSAIC, it can be all caps, doesn't have to be all caps, whatever. Text it, and then you'll get a set of text after that that'll lead you along the way to help you get connected to Mosaic. So we hope that you will do that today. Um, it is the official way we connect. We'll follow up with you through the course of the week if you do that. All right, a couple of announcements I have for you. We are going hiking next Saturday. So if you like the great outdoors and you like social distancing and a cool fall walk through uh, the uh, Blue Ridge Mountains, then you should come with us uh, to hike this coming week. Um, and so you can look all the information up that, on that is on Facebook or it's on our uh, Eventbrite page. You can look that up and um, encourage you to do that if you want to come with us. It's free. It's free for everybody. Just have to get out there to Milton. Next, uh, next week, we are starting uh, what we are calling Redeeming the Family Lounge, but it can be really anybody, and it's going to be a streaming lounge where downstairs in the basement, we will have a screen up and speakers and stuff, and we are not banishing families down there. It is just, so I can look at our families that are here today, it is just, if you get anxiety when you are here, feel free to uh, go down there and still have the uh, video and sermon and worship and stuff will be down there for you. And uh, we want to just make that available. Something that was brought to our attention was is that it is hard to bring kids without Minimo. And so Minimo won't be here uh, for several months still. And we do not have the volunteer base in order to do it right now. So this is kind of a middle ground that we're going to try to do. And hopefully it will work out. All right, with that, you can open up to Ephesians chapter 4. That's where we're going to spend most of our time today. And we'll be going from verses 7 to verse 16. Ephesians 4, 7 through 16. Now, Allie's birthday is coming up in just a couple of weeks. And I'll be honest with you, I kind of struggle with getting gifts. I particularly struggle with getting gifts for uh, Allie. I'm good at receiving gifts, and she's good at giving gifts, but I'm not great at giving gifts to her. Um, you know, because what I found out is when we first got married is that she's not really into the typical gifts that you might get what you think of a woman to, for their birthday or whatever. You know, things like jewelry and flowers and lotions and clothes. It's not that she doesn't like any of those things, except she says she hates jewelry, so don't ever buy her jewelry. But I learned very quickly that she does not like those things. And so I was told when we first got married, there's one thing that you never buy your wife. Never buy your wife any cleaning supplies, any cooking products, or any, any utensils or vacuum cleaners or anything like that because she will hate you. I learned, at least in my situation, that is false. And ladies, maybe you're thinking to yourself, yes, never buy me those things. But I found that the best gifts that I ever get, gave her, and you can ask her afterward, is carpet cleaners, vacuums, mops, floor polish, I kid you not, skillets exercise equipment, breaking all the rules, and you say, wow, are you trying to tell her something? No, these are the things that she asks for, and I just want to get her the things that she wants. And so, uh, you know, I want to get her things. I learned that she was very practical about the things that she enjoys for her birthday or Christmas, and I've gotten a little better over the years at uh, finding her things that are useful, things that improve and simplify her life, help her, uh, you know, help her lead our family and love our family, and it's just what she likes. Now, all of us have different tastes in gifts. If you're not the same way, and and, and you like, you know, if you're like me, I like uh, cool electronics and stuff like that. Um, we all have different gifts and types of gifts that we like, but we all like receiving gifts. It's a good thing. We like free things with no strings attached. Because if there's strings attached, it's not really a gift. Have you ever gotten one of those gifts before where you can tell that there's some strings attached? And you know that's not a true gift. Well, God's original gift to us was his son, Jesus Christ. 
on Christmas, he gave us a Christmas gift through Jesus. And he was born in Bethlehem. He lived a perfect life. And then Jesus goes to the cross, and this is the real gift. You know, Jesus isn't just someone that we look to and respect, although we do respect him. That's not all we, uh, that's not the only thing about Jesus, is the reason he is a gift to us is because Jesus was our salvation embodied, incarnated, in flesh. He came to earth, he died on a cross, God placed all of our sins on him, and when he died, our sins died with him. And then he rose from the dead to prove that it was true. And today, if we trust and follow him, we can have the salvation that he offers. John 3, 16, most famous verse in all of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son for us, for salvation. So that was God's original gift. But here's what happens. This is what we're going to see in our passage in just a minute. That Jesus comes to earth, and then he lives the perfect life, dies, he's resurrected. And after being resurrected, he ascends. And before he ascends, he is going to say, he's going to tell his disciples that I am going to send the Spirit to you. And so he sends the Spirit to his disciples, and in the Spirit coming, we are given gifts. That Jesus distributes gifts to his people. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Paul brings this up when he says that... um, Uh, that we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, that means whoever you are in all the world, whether slaves or free, wherever you land on the socioeconomic uh, ladder, we were all given one spirit to drink. That we are, through the power of Jesus, sending his spirit unified around the spirit so that we can have life and that we can serve God's church. That the moment you become a Christian... It's not something you have to earn. You know, we talk about not earning salvation, but you know what you also don't have to earn? You also don't have to earn the Holy Spirit. That when you become a Christian and you become a part of the church, which is the people of God, you are given the Holy Spirit immediately. And with that comes a gift. And like Allie, Jesus likes practical gifts. Through the Holy Spirit, he has given us gifts for practical reasons in his church. So this is a definition for spiritual gifts that I really like by a a pastor, uh, Warren Wearsby. He says, a spiritual gift is a God-given ability to serve God and other Christians in such a way that Christ is glorified and believers are edified. Spiritual gifts are different from talents. Talents are good, and we use talents uh, in the church, and God uses talents, but spiritual gifts are specific for the benefit and edification of the church. Derwin Gray, an African-American pastor in Charlotte, North Carolina, says it this way. Spiritual gifts are about bringing attention to Jesus and his redemptive purpose for humanity, not drawing attention to ourselves. In other words, when we use our spiritual gifts, it's all about pointing to Jesus, pointing to Christ. This is what Jesus has done for me, and look how I'm serving Jesus and how I'm serving his church. And so with that, we turn to Ephesians 4, and this is what the Apostle Paul says, starting in verse 7. This is the reading of the Word of God. Now grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. For it says, when he ascended on high, he took captives captive. Meaning those that were captured by sin were now captured by Christ, and he gave gifts to people. But what, but what does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower parts of the earth? The one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens to fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. Equipping the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son. Growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning and cleverness in the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow into every way into him who is the head, Christ. From him, the whole body fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament promotes the growth of the body for the building up, its, for building itself up in love by the proper working of each individual part. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, today, as we look at 
your gifts, Jesus, the gifts that you've given us. God, I pray that you would speak to us. And God, when you speak to us today, I pray that we would obey you. Or as a mark of your followers, that we are obeyers of you. And so, God, as you speak today, may we obey you. For those today that are listening that don't know you, may they come to know you today. May they come to follow you, capture their heart, and bring them to yourself today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to look at five gifts. I promise I'll be fast so we can get out of here and get some lunch. But uh, look at five gifts today. The first, is, the first gift from Jesus is the gift of leaders. Jesus' gift of leaders. Here it goes. It says, he himself, that is Jesus, gave some to be apostles. Now what is an apostle? An apostle in the book of Luke, if you look in the book of Luke, it is an office that is held by about 12 men uh, who were Jesus' apostles. Uh, Matthew... Uh, you think of uh, the Apostle Paul, you think of Barnabas, all these uh, 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 people uh, that were the apostles. This is kind of the first century apostles. But today, what is the gift of apostleship? Well, it just comes down to simply being a missionary. It's a missionary, it's a church planter. Uh, that's what you would think of as an apostle. Uh, some to be prophets. And the first thing we think when we think of prophets is probably fortune tellers or people that see the future. You know, you come, come in, I'll tell you your future. Or maybe you think of a fortune cookie, you break it open, and it gives you lottery numbers. You think you can win the lottery, and maybe you're looking for that person that has the gift of prophecy so you can get rich. But that is not what the scriptures mean when they talk about prophecy or when they talk about prophets. There are moments where the prophets tell the future, but most of the time it's about truth-telling. It's about bringing the word of God to the people. And so prophecy is, a lot of the times, what we do here on Sunday mornings during the sermon time. That is prophecy. Um, and then it says, some to be evangelists. Now, I've said over and over again, and I do not back off of this, is that when God calls all of us to himself, he also calls us all to be evangelistic, meaning tellers of the good news. Evangelism comes from the word euangelion, which is the Greek for gospel, which means that all of us are to be gospelers. Um, and so, but there are some people, though, that have a special gift that whenever they speak the gospel, whenever they proclaim the good news, it seems like their fruit is just more. And it, it is a gift of the Spirit. It's nothing they're doing, but something the Spirit has done through them. There's, some can be evangelists. And then it says some pastors and teachers. A pastor is a shepherd of God's church. That is his flock. They make sure that uh, false uh, uh, teachers don't come along and they also teach the truth. That's why it puts them together, pastors and teachers. They explain the scripture and take care of the flock. But not everyone here, although Jesus has gifted these to the church, not everyone here is supposed to be a leader in the church. And some of you are thinking, thank God, because I don't want to be any of those things. I'm very happy doing what God has me doing. Here at Mosaic, we believe that everybody is called to something. Whatever your job is, God has called you into that. And for some of us, it is leading the church, um, as with myself. This is a calling. It is a vocation in uh, the most exact terms. It's a high and humble, overwhelming calling often. I was talking to someone this week and just telling them uh, about what it is to be a pastor and just saying it is such a burden often to have uh, the burden of the church on you and taking care of God's church and doing a good job. Because if you're anything like me, you can sometimes beat yourself up over things and just understanding the burden that's there, but also trusting in Christ for all of the work. So here's the question. Why did Jesus give us these leaders that he mentions here as gifts to the church? Why do these leaders exist? Number two, the second gift here is that Jesus, is, Jesus has gifted the gift of ministry. Jesus' gift of ministry. Here we go. This is why. To equip the saints. Who are the saints? Well, it's talking about St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Augustine and St. Paul. And s no. Well, yes, it is. But it's also talking about you. From a real standpoint of the scriptures, all of us in this room, if you're a follower of Christ and you have trusted in the work of Jesus on the cross and you have been baptized into the church and you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, you are a saint. So on your next resume, you can just put that on there, Saint 
whatever your name is and really impress people. Be like, you've been sainted. Yes, by Jesus. And anyway, so we're all saints in here, every single one of us. And we believe that that means that there is no one between us and the Father. That all of us on our own, we can go straight to the Father in prayer. We don't have to go through a, um, a mediator. We don't have to go through a priest. But we can all go to G- Jesus ourselves as we believe in the priesthood of all believers. So, to equip the saints, that's you, the church, for the work of ministry. The work of ministry. Every single one of you, though you may not be a leader in the church, you may not be an apostle or prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, every single one of you is a minister in the church if you're a follower of Christ. Without exception. We believe that every member, every attender, every Christian is a minister in God's church. You are a part of the ministry of reconciliation, bringing people to follow Christ. And so we're all ministers. And why, is, why are we equipping the saints for the work of ministry? To build up the body of Christ. The body of Christ is Christ's church. And when God's people are working together in unison for the glory of God, God's church is built up not just in number. You know, it's, more, it's good for more people to be at church. I like people being at church. It's a good thing. But also in maturity and also in joy and worship, we are built up together. And so here's the deal. As pastor, my job is not to do all the work. Let me say that one more time. My job is not to do all the work. Now, if you look at this room right now, there are things that are here that are not always here, which means they got set up. And I will tell you, I did not do all the work. <laughs> uh, I, there's a group of people that comes here and makes sure that everything gets set up and everything is working, and I'm here with them, but they do most of the work. And that's a good thing. That's the way God designed it. The pastor, the leaders of the church, are to equip, give you the tools you need, the training you need, equip you and release you. Equip you and release you. Equip you and release you. That is the job of the leaders of the church period. It's not to be the person that is paid to do everything. And thank God we don't have a church that believes that. You see, if the pastor was doing everything, it would first be disobedient for me to be that way. I'm not being a good pastor if I'm doing everything. And I will tell you, during when COVID first hit, everything went crazy. And for a moment there, I felt a bit alone and isolated in ministry. I felt like I was having to do everything. And there were people helping uh, some, but it was, uh, it was a lot of hours. You can ask my wife. She's like, something's got to change here, bud. We can't, we can't be living like this. You have to release some of this. And so I came to the point, I was really, that's, be, that's me being disobedient for me to hold all that work. And so equipping and releasing. You think of it kind of like a bad parent who never prepares their, their child for life outside the home and working outside the home. I think about, um, you know, with our kids, we want to create a, uh, a good work ethic. So that when they get out the home and they get their first fast food job or movie theater job or whatever job they end up getting, they work hard. And as they get a job and their kind of like lifetime vocation, they work hard in those things. And so as parents, we train them up. And it may seem loving as parents to do everything for your kids. It may seem loving to never make them do any chores or anything like that. And I bet kids, my kids are like, yeah, I wish you would do that. That would be the most loving thing for sure. But I will say as an adult, it is not the most loving thing because it is not preparing uh, them to be adults. Uh, as I've said before, uh, we're raising adults, and it's the same thing in the church. Is As a pastor and as the leaders in the church, we're not here to kind of nurse along babies, but we are here to bring people to maturity and raise them up and raise spiritual adults. But secondly, not only would I be disobedient, but I would be stealing your joy as you follow Christ. The gift of service and the gift of ministry is a gift that gives us deep joy and satisfaction. The gifts that the Holy Spirit has has given you, if you are not using these gifts, then you are not experiencing the full joy that comes with your walk with Christ. Listen to what Galatians 6, 4 says. It says, But let every person carefully scrutinize and examine and test his own conduct. In his own work, he can then have the personal satisfaction and joy of doing something commendable. That when we serve God with how God has gifted us, we receive joy. But the third gift 
that Jesus gives us is the gift of maturity. So he gives us the gift of leaders, he gives us the gift of ministry, and third, he gives us the gift of maturity. Verse 13, until we've all reached maturity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. See, when the church leaders are properly equipping and releasing, and the people are using their gifting, the church continues to grow up. See, not only are we maturing as individual Christians, all of, we live in such an individualized society. Radical individualism is like so American, but so wrong. I think so often this pandemic has shown us that the idea of every single person is just their own is just not true. We are all interconnected. And when one person decides to be irresponsible and not wear a mask or not wash their hands, they can have devastating effects that we are all connected, we are all a community. And so the same thing happens in the church, that as you grow up in the church, as you grow up in your maturity in Christ, the church then grows up in maturity in Christ. And we mature not just as individuals, but as people. We all grow up. If the church is working right, spiritual babies always become spiritual adults. From babies to adults. Ephesians 4.14 says, Then we will no longer be little children tossed about by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning, with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. That as we start to grow up, we start to get stronger in our faith. That those roots dig deeper, as we talked about last week in Jeremiah, roots dig deeper into Christ. Babies are cute. Uh, we have a 10-month-old. Like um, he is cute. You probably just saw him crawl out the door here if you're, <laughs> you're in the room. Uh, cute little dude, hair spiked in the air and... Uh, he's, he babbles, does all the things babies do. Uh, he, um, he, uh, you know, he's still in the midst of nursing, and all of that is great for a 10-month-old. But if my 10-year-old was babbling and nursing, that would freak me out, and that would be a bit of a problem. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I'd be like, you know, it's cute for a 10-month-old, but not for a 10-year-old. In fact, it may be even sweet for a 10-month-old, but completely ridiculous for a 10-year-old year old. Um, you know, we, we kind of experienced this with our son Levi, who has uh, Down syndrome. It, when he's younger, he babbled like a baby, he should babble. And, and now he's eight, he's still struggling with that. Like we were just trying, we get him to speak words and, and it's a lot of work to bring him to maturity in the words that he uses. But we push him, we push him forward in that. So it's cute to be a baby. When you first come to the Lord and you first become a follower of Christ, it's kind of cute to be uh, simplistic in your view of things. And it's, it's cute to kind of like not understand things and stuff. But if you're 10 years down the road and you're still a baby in Christ, it's no longer cute. You just look like a 10-year-old nursing. Sorry for, the, sorry for the mental picture, but you get the point, right? How does God bring us to community? I think... Uh, excuse me, uh, maturity through his church. He does it through biblical community. He does it through sacrificial service of us using our gifts and spurring one another on. Hebrews 10 reminds us of this. It says, And let us consider one another in order to provoke love, to push people toward loving each other, to push people toward good works. Did I? Sorry. Um, to push people toward, I'll, I'll yell here. I don't know if it's coming through on the stream or not, but they'll fix it. Uh, to push people toward good works, to push people toward loving, and not neglecting gathering together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Um, so we're to gather together. We're to be God's people working together, being uh, together, provoking each other in love. We come in community. It's kind of like this. As we think of the, bodies, the, the body of Christ, we talk about the church. Uh, each of us are our body parts, what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians. And the, if I have an itch on my elbow, my left hand, my left elbow, my left hand cannot scratch that itch. But my right hand can reach across and help me scratch that itch, and it feels so good. My body has to have different parts doing different jobs in order to help itself and um, work itself uh, together. So Rick Warren says this. He says, your spiritual gifts were not given for your benefit, but for the benefit of others, just as other people were given gifts for your benefit. So our gifts that we give, that we've been given, are for us and they are for everybody else. So I want you, I want you to hear this. So pay attention for just a second. I know everything is distracting right now. 
but just listen in for just a second. Biblical community and gifted activity breeds spiritual maturity. Let me say that one more time. Biblical community and gifted activity breeds spiritual maturity. As we come together in God's church and we are actively using our gifts, God's church grows up. So the third gift is the gift of maturity. The fourth gift is the gift of unity. Christ gives us the gift of unity. Verse 15 tells us, speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head. So Jesus has gifted us unity uh, together. We grow into church. When the church is guided by the Holy Spirit, there is a natural coming together of Jesus, that we all have the same spirit inside of us. And as we're, we're, we're working together, the spirit is all is communicating with itself and we all move toward one point, which is Christ himself. That there is actually, we see no true unity without the spirit. Verse three tells us this in Ephesians four. It says, making every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. It's unity found in the Spirit alone. So for people that don't have the Spirit inside of us, then we're going to have a hard time with unity. I've been in churches. I've seen churches. I've heard about churches that have a difficulty with unity. They're not able to stay together. That people come in and they dissent and they, they, um, they're constantly causing trouble and backbiting and all these different things. And the first thing I want to say is there must not be the Spirit there. The Spirit must not be involved in that church, or at least there is enough people in that church that don't have the Spirit living inside of them. That church is not moving in unity. Because when the Spirit is working, we're in unity. It's a beautiful thing. And it's it's, uh, something that I'm so uh, blessed that our church understands. We come together in unity. John 13, 35, famous passage from Jesus says, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love God one another. That love and unity and desire to be and help and and spur along one another is important. There's no true unity without love. On a Sunday morning, we come and set all this stuff up, and I can tell you this, that we have a group of people that is very diverse in all kinds of different ways, not just like in the color of their skin. I'm talking about in all kinds of different ways. Um, Very diverse, and for some of us, the only thing that we have in common is Jesus. And that is awesome. (laughs) That is powerful. That people that have almost nothing in common can have Jesus in common. We're all different. The only thing is Jesus in common. We might have different socioeconomic backgrounds. We may uh, have different uh, gender, different race, different age. And I will say we have a very young church. Probably need to work on getting a little older. Not really anybody over mid-30s in our church. It would be nice to have some older people in the church. We should work on that. But we have different ages and different politics and ethnicity and backgrounds and language and profession. The only thing we have in common for a lot of us is Jesus, and it is beautiful. It is unity around Jesus for the cause of Christ and the glory of God. So it's unity, though, but not uniformity. And this is the fifth gift that Jesus gives us here, found in Ephesians chapter 4. He gives us the gift of diversity. Gift of diversity. From him, the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building itself up in love by the proper working of each individual part. Remember I said the body is different. That we all work different. We have different parts. We've all been given different uh, gifts and different jobs in the church. And that's what's so beautiful and how we can come together in unity, uh, uh, in diversity and in unity. Regarding diversity, here we see in 1 Corinthians 12, it says, Now there are different gifts, but the same spirit. Unit, uh, diversity and unity, same spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. There are different activities, but the same God works all of them in each person. There is diversity and unity as we gather around Jesus. Olin, my uh, uh, fourth born, he recently, he, he's in the bodies, and he got, like, anatomy, body. He calls it his body book, and he opens it up, and has, like, 
Uh, it's a pop-up book. It's really kind of cool, actually. And uh, it has, like, a head, and, like, inside the head, you can see the brain. You can, like, pop it up, and the brain pops up, and you can see the eyeballs. It's, it's pretty cool, and he really loves it. He says, he says, it's kind of freaky. This is a quote from him. It's kind of freaky, but I like it. Uh, and so I don't know if he's going to be a doctor or what, but he really enjoys this body book. And, you know, as I look at that and as I think about the diversity in God's church, it really does come to be like a body. Do you wonder where the term member comes from? You know, you can be a member of Costco. You can be, a, 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 you know, a member of this, a member of that, the member of the church. It is literally a tr- term taken from the church that talks about the members of the body. That those of us are arms, and those of us are legs and ears and eyes, all these different members of the body that we come together to form one body that works together toward a goal. You can't imagine that a body that's made of, like, all ears or all eyes... <laughs> That's nightmare fuel. <laughs> That's like the stuff that you, uh, you have nightmares about. A body only works properly when it's different parts working together with and for each other for the glory of God. Another way you can probably think of it, and maybe it's just in our name, is that it is like a mosaic. There's a reason that we call ourselves mosaic. That we are a diverse group of people that come together. We're different shapes, beautiful shapes that make something even more beautiful when we are united around the cross. I want to show you this picture. This is uh, called the, uh, um, let's see, the Mosaic of Jesus Christ. It is about from uh, 800 AD in Istanbul, and it's a beautiful mosaic here of Jesus Christ. Now, if you zoom in here, um, you can see that there are individual pieces of tile and glass that are used to make up this mosaic. That is what a mosaic is, after all. But each individual piece on its own is very beautiful. You know, if you were just to look at it and be like, oh, this is really beautiful. I love this. But it becomes something even more beautiful when it is put together. And here around Christ, we see this beautiful, um, this beautiful mosaic that was made in worship of Christ. And that is what we do as a beautiful mosaic. We are in our living and acting and using of our gifts and the shape that God has given us. We are put in our place in the mosaic and God gets glory and worship. And that's the whole point. The mosaic is even more beautiful when the pieces come together. Although each individual piece is beautiful, it's even more beautiful when the pieces come together around Christ. So all of us in this room, I believe, have a shape. A shape that is fitting. If you look behind me, you're like, what are all these, what's this spider web behind him every week? It's not a spider web, it's pieces of a mosaic here. If you look at our slides, you'll see little pieces of the mosaic. That is, we believe that those pieces are us. They represent us as we gather around. And each of us has a different shape. So what are some gifts that we see the Holy Spirit gives? And fortunately, we don't have to just guess on this. The Bible gives us a lot of them. Is it exhaustive? I don't know. But there's a lot of them here, and you can read them here. Here we go. The gift of administration, the gift of apostleship, the gift of celibacy. Some of you are like, please, God, no, no, don't let that one be mine. Okay. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) The gift of discernment, evangelism, exhortation. Faith, giving, healing, helps or helping, hospitality, knowledge, languages, leadership, mercy, pastoring, prophecy, serving, and teaching. All of these are gifts of the Spirit. Could there be other gifts? Of course there can be other gifts that God gives. And um, you may find some more in the Scriptures if you search a little harder. But these are definitely the ones that stick out the most. How can you know? What is my shape what, how do I fit in this mosaic of the church? Is anybody here, I'm going to ask, and I don't know, our church is a little different than maybe if I was in uh, uh, South Carolina asking this question. Um, has anybody taken one of those spiritual gift surveys before? Anybody? Raise a hand. It's, okay. A few of you have taken a spiritual gift survey. You take it, you do little bubbles and all this stuff, and it's like kind of like a, one of those personality tests, and at the end you come out, with what your spiritual gifts are, and it kind of ranks them and stuff. I have taken them. I've taken many of them. And, and you know, I, every time I get them back, um, I, I'm like, it's something different. So I don't know how much faith I have in them. I don't think they're bad. I don't think they're sinful or anything. I just don't know how helpful they are. What I've seen be the most helpful way of learning our spiritual gifts is this. The way to find our shape is this. First, God's brought you here for a reason. 
If you're here in this building, if you're even watching online and you want to be a part of this church and what God's doing, God has brought you here for a reason in his sovereignty. Meaning that there is a shape missing in our mosaic that needs to be filled. Does that make sense? I believe that is true. There's a gap in the church that needs to fill it. And the question you can ask is, why has God brought me here? Why have I, what gap am I supposed to fill? So that's the first question you can ask. God has brought you here for a reason. Second, where do you excel in service? Where do you see your, your work and your heart and your abilities excelling in the service of the church? And it's probably more expanded than you think. I mean, things like administration and uh, encouragement, which is exhortation, discernment, all of these things can be very helpful. Um, uh, the gift of helping. My, my wife uh, says that she has the gift of helping. She's like, where's the issue that needs to be fixed? And I'm going to help and make it. I'm, I'm going to fix it. That's what she likes to do. So she likes to help. So where do you excel in service? Others, um, ask other Christians. You know, that's one thing. A lot of times we can say, man, you know what? <laughs> my gift is in music. I am gifted in music. And you can't sing or carry a tune in a bucket. And you may ask your, uh, your Christian friend, say, is my gifting in music? And they say to you, ah. You know, let's have a talk. You know, um, you know, we all are gifted in different ways, and that's why it's so beautiful. There's a reason that I'm not up here leading the uh, worship ministry. Uh, we're all gifted in other ways. So ask other Christians. Uh, and then fourth, where is God leading you? Where is it that you feel as the Holy Spirit is in you, as we're working together in unison toward Christ the Head? Where is God leading you? And here's just kind of a pro tip on there. A lot of the times, the places and ways that God leads you in, uh, in your service ministry isn't always the thing you would expect. Sometimes you can be surprised at how God has gifted you. So I want to close with this question. Where are you serving in God's church? If you're a follower of Christ, where are you serving in God's church? None of us are observers in this thing. We are all in the game. We've seen, you know, if you're an observer, this is the time when you leave the church. Uh, just in the same way um, with our sporting events. I was watching the Celtics yesterday. Nobody, they won, you know, by the grace of God. Um, but nobody in the stands is empty besides the players in the game. And that's what's happened during this time. Is this really kind of whittled down? Who are the actual players? So, are you serving in the church? If you're a, part, a Christian, you should be serving in the church. So we have some ministries. I'm about to hit you with some ministries. I want you to pay attention and think maybe God's leading in these areas. These are some gaps that we currently have in the church that maybe you can help with. Admittedly right now, we, um, are, some of our ministries are on hold. Our Copley ministry is on hold that serves the homeless uh, downtown. Our Minimo ministry, as I already said earlier, is on hold because of the situation. They will come back. These things will happen again. But right now, we are on hold for those. But we do have some places that have some gaps. First, let's start with our band, our, our music ministry. Is We need a, a cajon. Um, that is the a cajon player. That's the little box they beat. It's like to keep the rhythm. So if God has gifted you in rhythm and you know your rhythms and your polyrhythms and your three over fours and all that stuff. I have no idea what I'm saying right now. I'm just saying things. If you know those things and you understand it, maybe God has gifted you in that way. Uh, our, our brother Jerome here faithfully plays the keyboard every single week. But maybe my man wants a week off. We're looking for a keyboardist that would help us every once in a while uh, and be a part of the rotation of um, musicians and, and a vocalist to uh, help uh, lead in that way. Our hospitality team, that's the people that really get this thing set up. When you see those signs that say welcome, they say mosaic, and you see these black banners with junk behind them, hiding chairs and stuff. Uh, this is put up by our hospitality team. It sets out the chairs and all that stuff. Maybe you can be a part of that, but really we are looking for somebody to lead this team. Has God gifted you in leadership that you could help lead and schedule and other people be a part of the hospitality team, help bring other people in? Fi um, uh, media team. This is uh, the dude you saw plug in mics and make everything work. That could be you. Um, we're looking for producers and people that will run our camera so that Justice doesn't both have to do the announcements and the camera. He can uh, just do one of those. And you think to yourself, it's COVID-19. I don't feel safe uh, coming if you're online with us today. I, I get it. It's a weird, weird time. And maybe you have someone in your family that's vulnerable. Maybe you yourself are vulnerable today and you have been joining us faithfully online. Keep doing that. But there's ways that you can serve, too. Let me give you a few of them. 
Our church online, the, the place where we have our chats and stuff, excuse me, stuff. We need hosts and a prayer team that can pray for prayer requests that come in during the week and people that um, can host and answer questions and share the gospel with people that maybe come to follow Christ in our church online. It's easy. It's not even that hard to do, and, and you can get set up in just a day, and I can help you with that. So we're looking for hosts and a prayer team. We're also looking to start a social media team. You know, we got Twitter and we got, we got all the socials, except for TikTok. I don't believe in TikTok, but maybe somebody convinced me. Otherwise, I hear it's not going away, which is... Uh, I'm really upset about. But anyway, all right. But uh, we have most of the socials, we'll say, uh, and we need somebody to help with our social media team. Maybe you have some marketing skills. Uh, maybe you can take, uh, you take pictures or you understand how to do social media. Help us with that. Finally, community groups. <laughs> you can serve by going to community group <laughs> and being a part and being contributing, but you can also serve by being a host and maybe being even a co-host. So when we get out of COVID, one day, as you've been co-hosting along with your host, uh, maybe one day you can then host your own CG. So these are on the screen. I'm going to give you a second to look at them, pray about them. And then I'm also going to ask you if you want so you can screenshot them if you're online and ask where God wants you to serve. Wherever you are interested in serving, we have another code. We're doing it all through text these days uh, rather than a card. Usually we have a card. But today you can... Text serve JP to 33777. That's serve JP to 33777 to begin serving today. So, what I want to do, this is unusual. I don't do this every single week. But what I want to do is I want us to pray, and I am going to give us 30 seconds of silence. It's going to feel like an eternity because it just is. And I want you to literally pray. Don't just sit there. Close your eyes and pray with me. And I will close us in prayer in just a moment as you pray about where God may have you fit into this beautiful mosaic that he has begun through his church. Let's pray. Give you 30 seconds. Take time and you pray. Jesus, thank you for your church. Thank you for the gift of yourself. Thank you, Father, that you sent your son. Thank you, Jesus, that when you left, Jesus, you did not leave us high and dry, but you gave us your spirit to dwell in and through us, that your church wouldn't just last a generation of people that rubbed elbows with the man, Jesus Christ. But God, your church would last for centuries and millennia through your Holy Spirit. God, I pray that today, that as you continue to shape and mold us and you have gifted us, God, I pray that, Lord, we would uh, lean on our shape that we have been given and we would fit into the gap that you have provided and the joy that we can have in serving and ministering to you and through your church for the glory of God, the good of the gospel, and continued worship of all peoples and all nations. God, today I pray for those that are not followers of you. They haven't become a Christian. They haven't decided to trust you with their whole lives. I pray that today they would make that decision, God. and Maybe they would pray a prayer, something like this, to begin it. Jesus, I trust in you with all my heart. I give you my life. I trust that you died on the cross for my sins and rose from the dead. Today I want to follow you and trust you with everything I have. In Jesus' name, amen.